Okay. Not it. Did it. Okay. So now we are live. Um, I'm going to do a brief intro. So thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this first session of the Biodesign Workshop led by Thomas Dugan. Thomas is an artist and also the director of Thomas Dugan Studio, a collaborative and multidisciplinary research studio exploring craft, design, material science, architecture and sculpture. In this lecture, Thomas will share his interest and research related to interspecies co-fabrication, which can offer platforms for and express design principles found within nature. He will talk about inquiries into design hybridization of non-human and self-assembly processes. He will share designs from the nanoscale to the planetary, which offer opportunities towards, towards ecosystemic re remediation. So thank you, Thomas, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, lovely to meet the new cohort to me and all the people joining online. So um, yeah, thank you very much. So this uh, talk is going to be maybe 45, 50 minutes. And um, I'll start by giving like a brief overview of um, where I'm at literally in terms of like where my studio is and some of the interests that I've been following over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so I'll start by um, yeah, saying my my process is is one of process rather than um, goal orientated. So um, yeah, and I work between lots of different areas between uh, craft. So I work a lot with materials with my hands, and I try and explore the possibilities of gaining a sense of intuition with the uh, material, and also um, work with what we call kind of advanced uh, technologies like robotics and things like that. So. This is um, <clears throat> just a few examples, um, uh, quite a varied career from um, kind of sculptural interpretations from an artistic background, um, as well as working within industry and um, as a set designer and um, yeah, kind of with architectural projects as well as product design. So I trained as a product designer at Central St. Martins um, and kind of quickly found um, the, the need for a diversity of my knowledge. Um, so maybe I'm not necessarily an expert in, in one field, but I try and bring together a multitude of experiences and knowledge and find kind of new paths within those different explorations. Um, so this is where I am. This is my studio, and this is where I'm speaking to you from. Um, the, the building um, is situated within an ancient forest. Um, and I spent 10 years um, in London um, working um, and um, I found that I needed to kind of explore my environment, uh, literally. Um, so I was always drawn to being surrounded by um, natural formations and um, processes of what I call now kind of self-assembly processes. So um, observing nature um, and understanding how we can bring these uh, design principles from nature in um, non-human processes into um, uh, explorations of sculpture and design um, and applications for design. So um, within, within those buildings. Um, one of the buildings houses um, what is kind of regarded as um, advanced technology and tooling in a, in a robotic arm. Um, but actually, um, I, I, these, these tools are somewhat uh, primitive in terms of the capability and um, the expressions that we find within nature. But I'm interested in the hybridity between the, the tooling and the self-assembling processes of, of nature. Um, and I've been working a lot over the last 10 years with proteins and the self-assembling ability of proteins. So it's not just coming from uh, my um, kind of forced approach to making, it's actually uh, 
discovering and researching that line between um, the kind of forced aspect, which is primarily how we seem to design at the moment. Um, examples of that are, you know, we might take a, a piece of wood and we try and force it into the shape of a chair rather than really understanding how to use the inherent properties and characteristics of that material within um, the design process. So those are my um, areas of um, exploration at the moment. Um, this is one example of um, researching into how we can um, kind of separate and also the two different realizations of one which is maybe a non-human process and one which is a human process or at least forcing the material. So the, the image on the left is exploring the miscibility between two liquids. So very commonly understood to be uh, like oil and water and how those different liquids um, uh, are, are miscible and they interact in a way that allows us to explore these non-human processes of pattern generation. So the way that um, the ink and the oil are interacting with each other gives us clues and um, invites us to explore the potential of these processes that are not driven by human um, ideas. The image on the right is, uh, is a contrast to that. So that's a pre-programmed um, algorithm that um, is, uh, again, just ink, um, but it's drawn um, by a robotic arm. So the, um, those two examples kind of show the kind of two linear pathways that um, design maybe can be um, perceived and um, conceived in, in different iterations. So this kind of interconnectedness of um, observation um, between technology, um, art, design, nature and fabrication is um, for me that confluence is something that is a driving force behind my work. Um, so I'm interested in how we can um, work with technology and um, nature and understand the co-fabrication between the two. And uh, somehow the, the technology is the um, ability to translate rather than um, offering that forced behavior of what technology could do. It's maybe just um, taking a step back and seeing how we can use the material and how the material can hold the information within the material. So those combinations between the two um, is, is the direction that I'm looking to explore at the moment. So the image on the left is lichen, which is obviously a bioindicator um, and a sensor. Usually it only grows in, in very uh, clean air um, and it's all around my studio. So it gives a real uh, clear insight into how these um, biosensors and how we can take these multifaceted material properties and understand how to use them. So for example, your skin has many, many different attributes. And even though the on a cellular level, it's very similar, um, depending on which part of your body that skin is, it obviously produces um, different material attribute, attributes of physical attributes. Uh, and also within your skin, there's complex biomes that live on your skin. For example, within the, the fold of your elbow, there are certain bacteria that produce um, lipids that allow your skin to be much more flexible. And without that biome and without the lipids, your, your elbow wouldn't be able to, to bend. So there's a huge complexity and beauty within um, the materiality. And um, it's about kind of understanding uh, how we can use those different multi-interfacing um, biomes and material facing properties that can give us um, a huge diversity of material characterizations. So the image uh, in the middle is obviously a, a three-dimensional scan of the, the lichen. And then from within that the kind of generated design that we are working with um, allows us to produce 
complex uh, bone structures. And in this case, this is made from porcelain. So it's maybe moving away in one respect from the capability of um, and the limitations of tooling and looking towards how the material can um, be encoded with that information. So the, the material is the driving force quite often behind my work rather than the technology. Um, and that leads me back into what I was saying at the beginning about the importance of um, mat material intuition. And um, I've been working with robotics for many years now, and it's, uh, it's quite challenging to actually allow the, um, the material to um, uh, give it agency somehow um, over the tool. Um, but what I'm interested in is working with the material um, and the advancements of what that material can offer over the tool. So what is technology? So technology is obviously uh, a fluid understanding. So technology, what we regard as technology now and in 10 years in the future and 10 years in the past um, is, is very different. And um, technology is obviously moving uh, very fast. But what I'm interested in is the fundamentals of nature and some of the design principles of nature. So when when this was made um, 1.8 million years ago, the the fundamentals that surrounded that object are very similar in terms of gravitational pull, in terms of the interconnection of molecular biology and that type of thing. So. Um, these kind of wider questions and wider explorations of fundamental principles that are seen through self-assembly and through biological um, growth and um, interaction is, um, is the pathway that I'm, I'm leading towards. So these technologies often um, you know, we, we quite often think that they are the, the be all and the end all. And there's been a, a huge drive and a huge push um, for for labs and um, yeah, industry in, as a whole to to just always buy and understand uh, and learn these these new fabrication tools. And it's quite often the material that is the limitation of um, how design is processed. So. Um, these these fundamentals of um, material and machine is um, yeah it's I'm trying to merge how how those two things are seen not independently um, but it's a it's a hybrid of the two and um, I think there's a huge uh, capacity and capability to to look much more towards material driven design and. Um, yeah, there's a huge advancement with within that industry, and these these usually occur at the, the micro and nano scale. Um, but what I'm trying to look towards is how we can implement these um, within larger uh, human scales. Um, so these fundamental principles of technology, you know, um, from from that axe head 1.8 million years ago um, to the the Milky Way and I think we all understand that the planets aren't 3D printed and the way that these um, th these incredible structures, um, they aren't um, they aren't man made, they're, they're self assembled. And in, in this instance, it's uh, the self assembling process is the gravitational self assembling um, system. So every mass within that galaxy attracts the other mass with a force inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So they're all interacting and they're all communicating with each other. And there isn't this hierarchy that we seem to understand that design, um, you know, it's quite often that the designer is, is seen as the, the person from a top down process making these decisions when actually everything else that's non-human around us is always from the, the bottom up process. So the simple idea of, um, you know, we, we're unable to, to sculpt a tree or even you know to go through the the complexity of understanding of how to create photosynthetic um, attributes at the scale that is surrounding my studio 
and these principles are um, in grounding in, in materiality and in uh, self-assembling processes. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, there, are, there are many, many different um, uh, combinations of materials and the, the potential for this in terms of using and understanding these towards design processes um, is, uh, I think, offers a, a lot more potential um, than we are currently utilizing within design. So going from zooming out to, to zooming right in again, um, the, from, from the Milky Way to DNA. So the way DNA works um, is, um, and any kind of self-assembly is through error correction. So you have the, the two base pairs that are always looking to make connection between each other and then to be able to, to build longer chains of, for example, proteins. So these um, pairs are constantly um, splitting apart and coming back together. And this is um, called um, local weak local bonding. So each one of those is a, is a very weak connection, but it allows um, the, the DNA to error correct. So it's constantly popping in and out of the, the base pairs and the connection of um, CG or you know, any, any of the base pair connections. So the way that we can then look towards utilizing this as a tool of engineering is to develop an understanding of how these base pairs are being joined together. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on in the week. Um, but for now, um, I just wanted to kind of share how these um, scales and these design principles um, travel from something as small as DNA sequencing all the way to, through to planetary scales. Now, the forces are different um, within DNA and molecular biology. It's not gravitational forces that are causing these things. But it's um, but it's the the principle of how these self assembling processes occur. To just quickly touch on the capability of these self assembling processes, um, this is an example in a paper published where a pig's heart was um, stripped of the protein. So a heart uh, is generally made up of about eleven thousand proteins. So they were able to, to remove these proteins and, and ultimately you are left with the, the cartilage of the heart, which acts as a scaffold for growth. So a scaffold for growth just means that it's biologically compatible. So you're able to take biological um, entities such as proteins or stem cells and then coat the cartilage with these stem cells. So this is exactly what the scientists did, but the, the incredible thing was the, the heart um, and the, the 11,000 proteins found their way of self-assembling. And then over the course of uh, four, eight and 16 days, the heart started beating on its own. So they, they put a, a small electrical impulse into the heart to simulate the pulsing of the heart. And then this was um, almost like a learnt behaviour by the by the protein, and then it, it started to beat on its own. So the capabilities of how we understand materiality is, um, you know, it, it really kind of uh, transfers across so many different scales and complexities. And some of this work is uh, in comparative to the existence of um, evolutionary processes and where we stand within the design aspects um, just goes to show um, the kind of speed with which these things are moving at the moment. And this was published in 2008 um, and the, the human uh, genome was uh, sequenced in 2003. And then, and then obviously from um, this capability of um, self-assembling at this level, it opens up a huge uh, possibility of growing um, new organs and parts of the body and things like that, which then brings into question the um, compatibility and the, the hybridity between um, 
the human being and more than human species and the impact with which um, we might be having on our environment through these technologies. Um, and as well as bringing up various ethical concerns and things like that. But for now, I just wanted to show, you know, some one aspect of how these processes are being used. Um, so the the way that these um, processes are able to, to self-assemble, it's essentially by putting energy into a system. Now, that energy um, within con traditional design and construction is a very um, laborious uh, task. It is often done at kind of highly skilled people. Whereas actually um, the within, within nature, um, there's information within the material, but ultimately it's just the energy that is being put into the system. So this is um, the work of Skylar Tibbetts, who runs the self-assembly lab at MIT. And this is an example of some work that he did, um, which shows that you can um, implement energy and um, as through self-assembling processes, you can create form and structure. So I'll just quickly play this video. So there is energy being inputted into this system in the form of kinetic energy. So he's shaking um, the flask and through that system of error uh, correction, which is the same thing that happens at, on a DNA level, these, um, these structures are being formed. Um, and the, the beauty with that is that you can, um, as a non-skilled um, laborer, let's say, or someone who isn't uh, a specialist in a certain field can understand through a sense of intuition, how much energy to put into a system and then for there to be ordered results from um, essentially what looks like a chaotic process. So, um, and that hierarchy of um, energy. So when you when you shake that uh, flask very very hard, the the energy would then um, break those bonds between um, between the the sphere. But if you shake it at just the right level, there's just the right amount of energy for that error correction to occur. The same as in DNA, where those bonds become strong, and then the sphere becomes a whole. This um, was a really uh, beautiful example of how we could um, observe um, our surroundings and understand how these principles are being um, created um, within nature. So this was a research trip um, that uh, we organized uh, last year in Mallorca. And um, I was amazed to see these um, balls, these spheres in the, on the ground and um, I did a bit of research and I found that um, it was a really beautiful process. And I think this is a really uh, simple and elegant way of explaining how you can put energy into a system and then get a structured order at the end of that process. So are uh, the image on the right. Um, so if, if you look under the water, there are the, the green um, uh, grass so this is um seagrass and then quite often during storms the seagrass is pulled from the base of the the seabed and then through wave action so you're inputting um, energy into that process and the movement of the waves um, and the rolling motion causes the seagrass to self-assemble into these amazing spheres um, um, and then so the, the image on the left, you can see um, the, the raw material, which are these very kind of flat um, grass structures. And then through the process of self-assembly, these, uh, these beautiful spheres um, amalgamate and join, join together. And then they're deposited all the way along the shore front. So this is just one um, simple, um, example of how these energy systems can be passed from one thing to another and create something of um, chaotic organization into something of a very ordered organization.
So I mentioned this idea of the bottom up processes and then top down processes. So it seems that uh, humans have decided that top down is the way to to think or design somehow. Um, and I think we need to reassess that. And um, all around us, we see these processes of, of um, self-assembly through bottom-up processes. So the, the liquid on the left is something that we'll explore this week. And it's a very um, simple um, combination of vinegar and um, sodium uh, bicarbonate. And if you combine these two um, materials, you can show example of self-assembling process. And um, there are two states. Um, generally, there's the dynamic and the static. Um, this is an example of dynamic self-assembly. So it's an exothermic reaction. So as the, as the um, liquid is trying to become into a much more stable state, it gives off heat. Um, so it's a supersaturated solution, which means that it's a very inherently very unstable. And if you apply um, um, an instigator in such as dust or a crystal, um, it creates this uh, chain reaction of self-assembly. So it transforms from a liquid into a solid state, which is inherently more stable. And as it does that, it gives off heat. Um, so you might know this in terms of a, it's a pocket warmer. So the commercial application for this at the moment is a pocket warmer. So you, you have a, a bag with this material inside and then there's like a little metal disc. And when you click the disc, it sends off um, uh, a chain reaction and then it transfers from a, a liquid into a solid state and it, it keeps you warm. So this is a, an experiment that we'll, we'll do later in the week. As a, an artist, um, I find ways of communicating these ideas to the general public or, you know, people coming to exhibitions. So a big part of my research and my role um, is to find ways to showcase this. Um, so I was um, invited to give an exhibition and um, I wanted to show this transformational process. So I created this glass table with um, lights shining through the material. So when the audience entered into the room, all they could see was this water-based solution. And then um, as, the, as that uh, water cools at about 53 degrees, um, then it instigates this transformation. So it starts this process of, of growing uh, crystals through the material. And it's a you know, really um, kind of simple way of showing these um, processes of transformation and self-assembling processes. Um, and the, the beauty of, of this as well is that you can reverse that process. So when um, it transforms from a liquid to a solid, it gives off heat. And the heat that it gives off is the heat that you have put into that system. So to re reverse that system, all you need to do is collect up the, the crystals, put them back into a pan, and then heat them to 53 degrees, and then it will return back to water. And it will continually do this. So as it cools, it becomes crystal, and then you can reverse it again. So this was just me describing and showing how we can use those wider principles of energy systems as our basis for design and design principles. Working with this protein and um, finding ways to um, utilize the um, ability of protein self-assembly within design processes. So um, this research is kind of twofold and the possibilities um, of how we can use this biocompatible material of protein, but also um, work towards things like reforestation and stabilization of soil and um, adding a greater sense of biodiversity to our environment through the, the process of growing mulberry trees. So these trees, um, act in, in many ways um, on the environment and the ecology in a very positive way. 
as well as giving us the opportunity to work with the silkworm and the silk protein towards um, technological and um, remedial processes within design. So I'll quickly give an example of just uh, one of those processes, um, which is a project that I did about eight or nine years ago now. Um, and I became um, very interested in this material because it has many um, biological attributes. And one of those is the ability to self-assemble and stabilize biological matter. So um, I won't go into those details now, but I, I will later on today. But I was approached by a, um, a stakeholder in the UK and they were interested in packaging their um, seeds um, for a rare bluebell seed that exists within the Outer Hebrides. So I did a huge amount of research into what material I could use and how I could then um, bring the, that connection of the non-human processes of the self-assembling of protein and also looking at how I could then um, bring aspects of design into the solution of this, as well as making something um, quite playful for children. So the protocol for um, extracting the protein from the silk cocoon is very simple. We just boil in water with salts. Um, it separates the fibroin and the sericin. The sericin is um, uh, essentially acts as the glue that glues the uh, continuous fiber together to make the cocoon. Um, I'll quickly show a video of what this looks like in reality. Yes. So just adding to the liquid to the um the silt and then through dissolving of the fiber we're able to produce a liquid material so the the beauty of this on many aspects is that um within the fashion industry uh the the silkworm is killed um because the fashion industry is concerned about a continuous thread so they can uh, weave garments and things like this whereas our research is much more interested in um the, the protein. So it doesn't matter if that fiber is broken at the scale of one centimeter, for example. So we can actually um, release the, the moth after, after the fact, rather than killing the silkworm. So once we have this um, liquid material, then we can start to um, experiment and play with how many ways we can um, allow this material to self-assemble. So this is an aqueous solution, which is a water-based solution. So within that water, there are many long chains of protein. So the beauty of uh, silk is it has a very long protein length, which means that you can um, allow it to self-assemble quite uh, quickly. And it goes from a, um, goes from a gel um, into a solid um, from a liquid to a gel into a solid quite quickly. And there's loads of uh, abilities to um, dope the material, add other material characterization to that material. Um, so this is just uh, one example of kind of like hybridity between using uh, advanced tooling, but also much more interested in the, um, the material itself. So this is generated design, which is um, an efficient net structure which allows um, the material to be deposited on a on a two-dimensional structure um, and yeah the, the way that the material can be um, implemented into that structure allows for the possibility of varying concentrations of that protein and the beauty of that means that you can then add multi faceted um, characteristics of that material. So at the nodal junctions between those points, you can have much stronger um, concentrations of the protein. And, and then you can start looking towards um, creating self-assembling structures on a macro scale. So this is the example um, of the tooling that was made to um, allow for this to be um, an experiment. Um, it's still a work in progress, but um, ultimately this is uh, yeah some, some movements towards that combination of uh, the complexity of the material kind of superseding 
some aspect of the comp complexity of the, the technology and in a way finding ways to find that balance but ultimately um, the material is um, the driving force behind the realization of that so this is a just a, a video of, of what that looks like and, and the different nodal points um, contain different concentrations and because of that um, it allows for th the drying rate and the cure rate to be um, different across that whole platform so like I was saying uh, skin has um, uh, it, it has a multitude of um, material characteristics you can then start implementing multi-material um, characteristics within that same protein so this is the the paper that was published on that and you can see on the the top right hand corner there so the that white um, shape um, is is what uh, is the starting kind of process and as it dries the material the protein assembles and then you create a very dense structure which is nine percent weight of water I mean, just below that so it's forming these very uh, strong crystalline bonds and then with those um, you can start to machine these um, so this is obviously just pure silk there's no other material within this and you can start to polish the material, you know, use kind of traditional tooling techniques um, within within this, but also dope the material so you can add um, an understanding of pressure sensors, biological pressure sensors, um, and uh, a huge array of technological uh, possibilities within that one platform of a material. And again, I'll go into that in more detail later. So these are kind of examples of scaling up um, potential. Um, this was very kind of early on in the research. Um, and the, the image on the right there is, um, it has very similar material uh, properties to acetate. So it's a biopolymer, um, you can machine it. And I've uh, produced um, kind of product design orientated aspects to, to that research. Um, and um, but what I'll show now is um, the the main interest for me was um, the the way that this material um, biologically stabilizes um, matter. These are some examples of the failed tests, which I thought I'd put in there. So um, it's uh, it's not all kind of rosy, <laughs> you know. The the way that you control the the rate of drying, the way that the the self-assembling processes often um, puts considerable stresses across different materials. Um, so yeah, it, it, from those people that work with biomaterials, they'll understand what these images look like. <laughs> but um, this, uh, yeah, so th that idea of like taking one material and then through um, quite simple processes, you can actually um, give that material lots of different properties. So this is, that same liquid state that you saw in the test tube, but this is then freeze dried. So the posh term for that is lyophilized. So it was lyophilized in um, a freezer, which just means that the water is frozen. And then under a vacuum, the water is then removed. So the same when you get freeze dried uh, food, for example, and then you rehydrate it with water. This is um, freeze-dried silk. So the, the protein has um, self-assembled along the, the structure of the water crystals and um, the water is then removed. So what you're left with is a very lightweight foam structure. So this, to give you a sense of scale, is roughly 600 millimeters long and 150 millimeters wide. Um, and it weighs about six grams. So it's very lightweight, um, it's very strong, and um, it obviously gives this kind of beautiful aesthetic in the way that it iridesces. Um, so I, I was kind of researching this material and um, working with that uh, stakeholder as a packaging um, designer. I found that um, I was able to, to biologically stabilize the seed within this protein. So that led me on to understanding how do I want to, to package this seed. Um, and when I was young, I always found these fascinating, This is the maple seed, which you throw in the air and it spins and then it lands and then it grows. So I collected 400 of these and tested them all for flight. And 
um, various kind of uh, parameters as to the size of the bulb versus the size of the wing. Um, and then 3D scan this with a very high precision um, laser scanner. And then just to kind of give me an understanding of what these structures might look like and whether I need to manipulate the design of this, um, this found object, um, I 3D printed in ceramic. Um, and then kind of using traditional design processes, um, wanted to create a mold of this seed. So I scaled the original seed by uh, 3x. Um, and I thought that would um, hopefully still fly, but I wasn't sure, obviously, because I was kind of <laughs> implementing my own design ideas onto something that was derived and designed by nature. But I needed to um, to do that because um, I wanted it to, to be able to carry the biological matter within that seed structure. And the weight of those seeds was about 0.72 grams, I think they were. So using um, very traditional sculpting methods, um, I 3D printed that seed and then um, made a, a mold of it, um, which was a silicon mold, which then allowed me to um, inject the, the aqueous protein solution within that mold. And then also put um, the, the bluebell seeds within the, the, the seed, the silk seed. And then once you um, do that, I put it in the, the freezer and then uh, freeze dried. So the, the seeds that you can see um, here are the black seeds. So these are bluebell seeds. So when the, the maple seed flies and it lands, um, the, uh, the protein will degrade and just be reabsorbed within nature because it's um, implantable within the body, it's edible, it's biocompatible. Um, and then the, the, the bluebell seeds, once this uh, supporting structure has um, uh, basically been absorbed back into the environment, the seeds are then able to grow. Um, we're able to uh, manipulate how strong the protein is and also how stable um, those uh, structures need to be. And they can be timed to degrade at different rates. So obviously the wing would degrade a lot quicker and the bulbous section will then continually uh, continue to support the, um, the, the, the life of the bluebell seed within there. So those bluebell seeds are biologically stabilized. And then with um, you know, a joyful throw into the air, these maple seeds can then fly and uh, land on the ground and support life. So this is a high-speed camera, um, which shows the, the vortex is created by the, the seed wing, and also this helical structure. So this right-handed helical structure that you see um, on the left-hand side, which shows the flight path of the seed. So this is just one example of my research and um, design into uh, materials um, and, how these materials can be the, the front runner, let's say, for design processes. Um, and then to just quickly speculate, you know, how do we use these to, to study our environment and how do we um, utilize these um, biocompatible um, and biodesign materials um, within the environment, such as biosensors, things like that. So there's a full circle of potential in terms of using these materials to act as um, ways to understand uh, remediation um, within the local landscape. So thank you very much.